everyone, and welcome to um, Salsa's digital session on Rules as Code. I'm super excited to be here, as you can probably tell from the accent, I've come quite, um, quite a journey to come here and talk to you about Rules as Code in general, uh, but specifically what's happening in the Australian government in Rules as Code at the moment. There is quite a lot happening down there. Um, and I think that we've really progressed a lot recently, and that's largely because we have a government sponsor, um, a whole government uh, sponsor, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about in a moment. Okay, so what's on the agenda today? We have an eight-part agenda. Uh, first of all, some introductions. Uh, then we'll talk about what is rules as code. Some of you here may already be familiar with it, some of you may not. Uh, we'll look at rules as code and actions as well to actually give you some examples of what it's like. Um, and then we'll look at the GovCMS context. So GovCMS is the whole government platform that is currently um, making some great waves in rules as code in Australia. And then we're going to take you through the process. So if it's something that you're interested in doing for yourselves, um, you have some idea of how we go about getting from legislation or rules um, through to um, our process, which is Open Fisca Drupal, of course, we are a Drupal conference after all, um, and then the next steps as well, and of course, a bit of time for questions. Okay, so first of all, some introductions. My name is Philip Martin. Um, I used to work primarily in content, I am user journeys, and about two and a half years ago, I got involved in Salsa's Rules as Code Digital Practice. Um, and this is an area that um, sort of harks back to uh, a long-held interest I've had in law and all things legal. Um, and so now I'm doing largely business analysis for rules as code. In the room today as well, we have Kristen Paul, she's down at the front here. Uh, she's a Drupal technical lead at Salsa. Uh, she's also, you may know her from the Drupal community, very active in the Drupal community, and is also on the Starshot, Starshot Advisory Council. So normally, Chris is actually not in our Drupal Rules as Code team, but she's kindly uh, helped me out today with any technical questions that we might have uh, at the end. Actually, I might ask now, how many people in the room are technical? Who's a dev type person? Oh, quite a lot, okay. All right, you can ask her those questions later on. Okay, so I'd also like to give you a bit of an introduction to GovCMS. Uh, GovCMS is a whole of government Drupal content management system and web hosting platform. It's pretty cool because what they did was, I think it was about eight years ago now, they were looking at the fact that there were so many different government websites on different platforms using different content management systems um, and all of that duplication. And so they decided it would be great to consolidate and build one platform, make it so um, good that everyone would come to them. So now they have over 400 websites on the GovCMS platform um, and they're able to offer the SaaS um, and the PaaS, so service um, as a service offering and platform as a service offering. Obviously it's Drupal based, that's why we're here today. A little bit of an introduction to Salsa. Salsa Digital is a digital innovation agency. Uh, we definitely have a background, a strong core is Drupal. Uh, so we've been doing Drupal web development for 20 years now, roughly. Um, and we're also active in some of the largest programs in Australia, government programs. So for example, we work with GovCMS um, offering that platform, and we also work with the state of Victoria and the state of Western Australia as well. Okay, so now I'm going to the start of the fun stuff. What is rules as code? So at its most basic, basic definition, rules as code is about taking legislations legislation, rules and policies, or any kind of regulation, turn it into machine-readable code, and then we get an output of a rules as code API, um, and of course, a user experience. In terms of our software stack that we use, we use an open source software called OpenFisca. OpenFisca was developed in 2011 by the French government to actually codify their social security benefits. Um, so it's and I'll talk to you a little bit more about OpenFisca later on, but it is a Python-based rules engine. And it's open source. We pair that with Drupal, probably partly because we've always been a Drupal agency, and so that was instinctual for us to look at how we could um, work with those together. Uh, and to do that, we built a OpenFisca Drupal module. In terms of the high-level architecture, 
architecture, we can see, and also the flow of, of how it works, you can see we have on the bottom right there, we have the legislation. That then gets codified using open FISCA. It then has relationships with Drupal or GovCMS. It can be straight Drupal, of course, or the GovCMS group distribution. We get the inputs from the different sorts of user experiences. It can be websites, which is what we're using at the moment, but obviously um, there's an, uh, an option there to go into mobile apps, voice devices, etc. And then the outputs come back. Um, once the user has put in some inputs, then they get outputs back from Drupal and OpenFisca, and the person's given their results. One of the most powerful things about rules as code in terms of its potential is for rules syndication. So you could have one rules engine that's serving multiple websites, multiple interfaces, and they don't all necessarily have to be government. So you could have a government department that is the rules keeper, but yet there might be other websites that pull on those um, rules information using the OpenFisk API. So for example, you might have um, some border force type information that is um, held by the government, and then you might have an airline website or a holiday website like United Airlines who pulls that information and displays it on their website. In terms of some of the other benefits and why rules as code is so powerful for government agencies and for others, um, it reduces ambiguity. You have a clear and certain citizen experience. It's more accessible. So instead of people having to read through legislation or summarised more plain English version of legislation, they can actually interact with it without the legal jargon. It's also reusable, as I mentioned before, so for rule syndication. Uh, it's easier to manage, so once coded rules are easier to manage and change. Uh, it also helps with transparency, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. And one of the things that I think is really powerful about rules as code is that you can actually use it to inform policy. So you can do policy modelling to see how changes to policy might affect the government, affect people, etc. It's also recognised globally. So the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2020 released a report called Cracking the Code, Rulemaking for Humans and Machines. In that report, OECD said, by creating a machine consumable version of government rules alongside the existing natural language form, governments may be able to drive better policy outcomes, increase efficiencies, and open up new avenues for innovation. It also is just six principles for a successful rules as code approach, being transparency, traceability, accountability, appropriateness and appealability, availability and interoperability, and security. A follow-up report in 2023 about global trends in government innovation identified rules as code in terms of its transmitted power um, and specifically its ability to, to make government more transparent. Now, this next slide is going to blow your mind. There's also recently been a cost-benefit analysis. When I say recently, uh, it was released in a publication. It was a report that was uh, took a little bit of time, obviously, to do. Uh, but it was publicised in a publication in Australia uh, in late 2023 by an Australian man called Tim D'Souza. And he found that for every dollar invested in rules as code, it gives back a $2.60 one benefit. And rules as code can be quite time consuming in the front end to actually like front loading it, not the front end is in development, but front loading it because you know to get all of those rules, the existing legislation that we have, with all of the amendments that have happened over the course of you know in some cases a hundred years, um, obviously it can take a bit of time, but even with that you still get this really strong um, return. Okay. So seeing is believing, let's show you some um, examples of rules as code in action. First of all, who's using rules as code at the moment? This isn't an extensive list, but it just gives you a bit of a taste. So here in the US we have Benefits Launch Express. Anyone heard of this application? I hope something for you to Google later. Uh, we also have Policy Engine. I'm going to give you a bit of a demo on Policy Engine later on. It's based in the US, but they also have a UK website and they're also um, starting off in Canada. Moving to Europe, we have Belgium's Aviation 
portal, which is used for pre-screening and lodging for aircraft license application. In France, we have MESAIDS, which is the benefits qualification. So that's the one that I mentioned earlier, Open Fiscal was originally built for, to do the social security benefits in France. Uh, then in Australia, we have Austrac, and obviously the Australian government and WCMS initiatives that I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit. Uh, in New Zealand, we have Smart Start, and another example called Benefit Me, which I will take you through now. So two examples I'm going to look at today. Uh, better for me and policy engine. So I've actually recorded a little screen break, so I'll show you that in a moment. But better for me is uh, codifies New Zealand social security benefits. It's an alpha release, so it doesn't have all the benefits. It's only got four, uh, but there are other people who are working on that at the moment. Uh, it was originally a project that uh, Sasa Digital was involved in, and when I first got involved in Rules Code as well. And it was for that project that we built the Drupal web form um, and module to integrate with Open Fisco. As I said, it checks for social security benefits at the moment um, and obviously includes calculation logic for how much people should get. So I'll show you a little video now. Can you see that? Okay, so this is the home page. You can scroll down, there's a little bit of information. And then you get to a web form. So this is where the person interacts with the web form. So here we've got some drop downs to start. So the person selects, I am and I'm not, puts in their age, uh, whether they're currently working, um, whether they have a disability, whether they're single. Here they put in any children they have. This is some conditional logic in the normal Drupal web form here. So for zero, nothing just comes up. They put in their earning, what they earn a week. And then also how much they spend on accommodation a week. That again brings up some extra fields. And then also the postcode. And then they can submit. So what happens now is that Drupal web form is hitting the open Fisca. It's putting in that information as inputs and then outputting what the person is eligible for. In this case, they're eligible for in total $319 per week. And then it's got the um, parts of that payment is made up of. So it's made up of job seeker and also a combination supplement. It also then lists the payments they're not eligible for. So when we get to the Drupal part, I'll tell you a bit more about um, how this is uh, working in the back end and how it all integrates with OpenFisca. Now for the policy engine demonstration, policy engine calculates benefits and taxes. But it also does policy modeling via micro simulations. Uh, in case you're interested, it's an open fiscal fork. So it's not using the original open fiscal, but a fork of that one. Again, I'll run this demonstration. And that's the URL there if you want to look at that later. The video is just loading. Okay, so we've got the compute taxes, but we're going to go straight to the compute policy reform impacts. Then we have a whole list of departments where the legislation resides. In this case, this example, I'm doing an um, IRS example, and we're going to change the income tax for a particular tax bracket. So you can see we go down to income, click on income there, the bracket, and then we're going to change the tax rate of bracket two. So at the moment, that's sitting at 12%, change it to 10%, hit return, and then you can, on the left-hand side, you can click on the Calculate Economic Impact and have a look at what changes that will be. So you first of all, you present it with an overview. So that to move, we'll see the results. So we've got the overview there that's going to cost 79.3 billion, it's going to lower poverty by 0.2% and raise net income for 71.5% of people. Then you can drill down to additional information about the budgetary impact. You can see it's got graphs as well. Um, you might want to look at the winners and losers and by income. Uh, there's some and have a look there. You can see again some more um, data visualisation so you can see what the impact is. You can also go even deeper and look at specific things like the impact by age, race, gender, etc. And again, we get the data visualizations there. Another 
tool that it has is the ability to create an AI summary. So I used to use chatbot, but I noticed when I was doing this new recording that they're now using a different, um, using Claude 3.5 summons. And I didn't think of this for this demonstration, but if you do, it actually gives you a report. It's something that you could submit to perhaps a minister or someone else, um, a, a government official to show them the effects. And you can also see the Python uh, code as well. So very handy tool. So yeah, I definitely encourage you to check out Policy Engine. Uh, it definitely sort of shows um, one of the really fantastic use cases for rules as code. Now I want to talk about uh, what the Australian government is doing. All right, so I also mentioned that GovCMS, whole of government digital platform, consolidating a whole heap of different CMSs and websites onto the one platform using a Drupal distribution. Um, but in late 2022, GovCMS decided that they wanted to improve the platform through providing personalised digital experiences. One of the examples, they had a few different sort of user stories or use cases, and one of them looked at a citizen who was trying to find out if they were eligible for a benefit. So, although rules of code is not traditionally associated with personalisation, obviously in terms of that use case, it was a perfect fit. For us, um, Salsa Digital 2, we have just done the benefit for me, but we were still actually doing it, um, and we knew straight away that it was a great fit. So we then pitched rules of code, um, to Gaxiness to see if they'd be interested in exploring that as a personalisation option. They decided they did want to see what it could do and commissioned a proof of concept. Now we had a few different um, potential topics we could do. I'm sure everyone's recognising that uh, lovely image on the board there. Um, but yeah, basically in the end Gaxiness decided that they wanted to um, use a proof of concept to look at whether someone uh, needed to have another vaccination for COVID or not, whether they were due. So we created a proof of concept that took them through different screens, information about them, whether they were immunosuppressed, etc., how many um, immunisations they had to date, and then whether they were due for another vaccination or not. Um, after that, GovCNS set, Gov set up a sample program. So this kicked off in the beginning of this year. Uh, I think it was actually at the very end of last year, but obviously with, um, uh, in, in Australia we have a bit of a shutdown uh, around January, so it's summer over there, of course. Uh, so yeah, we set up the sample program, and basically it lets Australian government departments experiment. So GovCMS has funded um, government departments to, on the GovCMS platform to do little mini proof of concepts. These are small little use cases, proof of concepts where they can try out different ideas um, and they're very small, they're like in total 96 hour engagement. And it's really just to give them a little bit of a taste. Um, and we take them through the end-to-end -end process as part of that. So we go through rules mapping with them, through discovery workshops, then we do the open physical coding and the Drupal workflow build and results and also run sessions with them if they want with their tech people about how that's done. It gives, them, it gives them the ability to test their own personal use case um, and also the tech stack itself. And upskilling in rules of code is another key area for this program. It's really important for GovCMS that the GovCMS customers, so the people sitting on the GovCMS platform, can upskill internally. So if they want to use a vendor to expand them beyond the sandpits, they can, but they can also try and upskill in-house so that they have those skills in-house. So far we've done six proof of concepts and we've got three underway. And in fact one was actually just showcased yesterday. So I guess we've got seven proof of concepts today and two more underway at the moment. In terms of what sorts of things we've been doing, we've done quite a bit around eligibility, which is one of the key areas for rules as code, so it's not surprising that we've looked at eligibility. So for example, um, one of the first ones we did was actually looking at whether people were eligible to have their website on the GovCMS platform itself. There was certainly el certain eligibility criteria. So that was our first cut-off rank. Um, other ones I'm not at liberty to mention, but to give you an idea, it's been things like eligibility for health services, eligibility for visas, um, eligibility for social security benefits, those sorts of areas. Uh, also, it can be used for compliance. 
So one example of this is in Australia, we have a department, a government department called um, the uh, Digital Transformation Agency. Uh, they look after quite a few things, but one of the things that they do is when a department has some sort of project and investment that they uh, that's got some digital elements, it actually has to go through the DTA and meet certain frameworks. Uh, so we set up a proof of concept, which I'm going to show you in a moment, actually, um, to see whether um, items had to comply to the um, investment oversight framework. Another example is improved user journeys. And that DTA one is actually a really good example of that because their current, because these are all standards, so they're all self-hosting, they're not put into the gut CMS environment yet. Um, but so their current user journey that they have is the person has to go in and read eight, nine, ten pages of content, there's diagrams, and they have to kind of get their head around, does this apply to me, this is relevant to me, this isn't relevant to me, I don't think this applies to me, and sometimes they're still not sure. Um, so this provides them with a much more improved user journey where they enter in information about their investment, and then they're actually given, yes, you do need to comply with this framework. Policy twins is also um, another key area. So obviously that example I showed you before of policy engine, that is a type of policy twin where you have a twin of the legislation, like a digital twin, but a policy twin, uh, and then you're able to actually model what changes will happen into the legislation. So you can create a policy twin based on existing legislation, do modeling and a whole heap of other stuff with that policy twin. So, as I said, I'm going to take you through two sample examples today. One is the Digital Transformation Agency, and one is a calculation of severance benefit. So, again, just to make sure we didn't have any issues with Wi-Fi, I've recorded these. Um, so, these samples, just before I hit uh, go for this, these samples are all um, spun up sort of automatically, and we have some common areas in them all, so they all look very similar because they are just proof of concepts. Okay. So this is the um, DTA one. Just loading here. Okay, so from the home page, um, as I said, you can just click on, um, go straight there. Well, these are the sorts of areas we've got about open fiscal rules as code in action, about government's rules, rules as code samples. And the rules code action has got a whole rules of code in action. It's got a whole um, heap of different links. So this is made for just imagine you've been working on a proof of concept. You've got a very specific audience, but then you want to go back. They want to show it to their higher ups to tell, to show them what it's all about, and that just helps and provides some contextual information. Here we have a bit of an introduction. Then they go into starting the web form. So my investment proposal is or is not a new policy proposal, um, is the digital or ICT enabled. You can also change these and then it provi provides a submit button and tells you that you're not, you don't need to comply. So in this case, if we say the investment proposal is not a digital one, then it's the investment oversight framework does not apply. We also provide them with their selection so that they can make sure they input everything correctly. But let's just say it is a digital ICT enabled one, so they continue working through the form. They're a non corporate entity. Um, the project is not classified, top secret, and the proposal is a large one with more than $30 million. So then they hit submit, and they're told, uh, again, that's calling out to the Open Fiscal API, and then that's sending the um, results back to, um, to Drupal. And they're told that the investment proposal does need to be assessed by the investment oversight framework and it also needs to be assessed under the ICT approval process. These rule statements are something that we're providing in every sample. It just helps with this transparency. So you can see here that it's actually saying what the rules are so they can access that information as well as the interactive web form. Okay, now I will take you through to our next example. So this one shows some calculations again. So again, you can see it looks very similar, just some slightly different colours. Still got all of that core information so that if they're wanting to show it to managers, their managers, managers, other teams, etc., that they can um, then navigate to that extra information about rules as code. 
Uh, and this one is looks at if someone's about to leave the public service, uh, how much they would get in terms of their severance pay. So this one starts with a little bit of a disclaimer. Once the person's selected that they've read there, they can put in their name. Um, in this case, I've just put test. Noticing also that you can put in help tips, of course, to explain things. Uh, in this case, if they chose casual, they automatically get the not eligible um, on this page rather than hitting submit. But let's continue on with the case where they would be eligible. So this is all the information they would know. How many hours they currently work in a week? 38. What's the current annual leave entitlement? So in the case I've done 24. Um, are you receiving a parliamentary staff allowance? Uh, are you leaving because your employer will cease to hold office? And then how many day, how many years of active service you've got? From there, it calculates how much you should get if you left. Um, and then it gives you a bit of the base information, so the salary, the PSA amount, which is pulled from some of the details they put in before, the total salary, the payment that they got from their annual leave, and also the severance pay that they received too. So that is that example. Okay, now on to the process. All right, so how do we get from the legislation to those finished products that I just took you through? Okay, so we start off with doing some rules analysis and mapping. Then we move to open fiscal configuration and coding. Got the Drupal web form, and then we should have the results. So in terms of the rules mapping, and don't worry, I know you won't be able to read everything on that screen. It's just to give you a visual of how we do it. Obviously, there are different ways that this could be done. This is the process that we're using. Uh, we start off on a mirror board to make it nice and visual. Um, and we basically go through the process of rules analysis and rules statements, eligibility logic, questions. We map that into a spreadsheet, and then we run some test cases as well. So the rule statements are plain English versions of the legislation or rules. It provides inputs for the questions, for the logic, and the results pages as well. It's a way to validate and cross-check the mapping as well that we do next. Um, and of course, as you've seen, you can also publish the rule statements to help with transparency. Bearing in mind too that it depends who's doing them. This particular step, I would say, could be skipped if you're actually the subject matter expert. So if this is legislation that you're really, or rules that you're really across, you probably don't need to do this step unless you want to put them up on your um, website for rule statements. But as a business analysis, it's also a way that I can get to know the legislation. Okay, so let's have a look at an example. A person can get the supported living payment if they're 16 or over, meet the residential requirement, and they're totally blind. Uh, now this is just to show you again, I'm not expecting you to be able to read everything here, but basically the way this is laid out, on the left we have the legislation, a screenshot of the legislation that's dropped into a mirror board, so if you could use any mapping tool, you could do it in lots of different ways, this is just the way we do it. And then you've got the person P is eligible if, and you've got the different, the, the pink stickers of the different eligibility requirements that they have to meet. Notice also above each pink sticker, there's a little um, box with a number in it. So the first one we can see it says SSA 34C. That's a part of the legislation. So this way you've got an easily referenced tool for where the legislation, what part of legislation holds that requirement. So it's Social Security Act 34C. And our coders do use that as well, which is great because it means that once it's in open FISCA, you can always, if there's a change, you know, and you know the change happened to 34C, you can actually grab that piece of code from Open Fisco or find that piece of code quite easily. So next we do the questions. So we know what information we need. So what questions do we need to ask? So it's things like, how old are you? I am or am not a New Zealand citizen or permanent resident. I am or am not totally blind. Just some examples. We then pop that into a spreadsheet, so you can see some of the columns here. We've got the question number, what the question is actually, the question contents and what question is actually being asked. In this case, what type of organisation are you? We've got some of the open FISCA um, variable names and stuff coming in here as well. Uh, what the values are, and then also the Drupal type of, in the web form, in terms of radio up and drop down, etc. The Drupal value, and then also the path. So if they answer, you know, the first option to this first question, then they're taken to question two. 
But if they answer the second option, then they take the question three. And you can see down the bottom line there, um, other entity or organisation, and it takes them off to a different page entirely. We also put into the spreadsheet um, test cases. So these test cases are used to other developers when they're coding in Open Fisco, and they're also used by our QA team to actually check that everything is as expected. So you can see here in this one, organisation type equals Australian government department or entity, um, and that it's listed on the PGPA flip chart, which is a very jargony Australian government thing. Um, and then that would return the output, and that should be eligible equals true. And then we've just got some other examples there. So, I know that a lot of you said you're developers in this room, so you may be wondering why open Fisca and not Drupal. Well, it's true we could have done a lot of this in Drupal, but Drupal is not made for this. Drupal is made for content and content modeling. Open Fisca is made for rules. So it's been set up specifically to create rules, eligibility logic, and calculations. Okay, now we're getting into the technical part. First part of that is Open Fisca, and then we move to Drupal. So in terms of the Open Fisca, I mentioned earlier that we um, begin with test scenarios because it's a test-driven development style. So this one here is the test scenario for sole parent support entitled. So you can see you've got the name, the period, the absolute error margin, the inputs, and then the output. Now one of the things with Open Fisca is that they also have this concept of entities. As you can imagine for social security benefits, that's really important because um, you have often lots of different entities. You have a person, yes, but then you may also have a household, you have children, etc. Um, so the first thing you do is to set up your entities. So each person and family. This one on screen, which you definitely can't read because it's too small, is the entity for family. Next, we create the parameters. So for example, sole parent support and the age threshold. And we include variable attributes being description, reference, and values. Next, we create the variables. So here are some um, input variables. So sole parent support, spouse or partner die, sole parent support, marriage or civil union dissolved, etc. And the variable attributes. So there's the, the, there are uh, on the screen, value type, entity, definition, period, label, and reference. Now we also have to create the output variables. So that just showed you the input variables. These are the output variables. So in this case, sole parent support entitled. Some of the attributes for these ones, again, value type, entity, definition period, label, and reference. And then we have a formula as well to calculate the rules. Noting here too that this can be changed, we can include dates in here, which makes it really, really handy, because if you know you've got a legislation change or even a value change, so say you know, you've got a CPI indexing thing that's about to um, happen, and so you're able to program that in, it also keeps a historical record of all the past versions of the law. Now onto the Drupal part. Okay, so basically the aim of using Drupal was to be able to make the editor experience as painless as possible. So we've got two main areas that we're using Drupal. One is for web forms, and you can either do a single web form or a series of web forms. So when it's a single web form, that was the examples I showed you. But you can also do a series. I mentioned with the COVID example, we sort of talked about you, so that was one web form. About your health, that was one web form. And then about your um, vaccination history was another web form, but it looked like it was just part of one user journey. Uh, the Drupal module allows us to map the web form fields with the corresponding fields, fields in the Open Fisk API. And then we also use nodes um, to add the rules for branching. So for each web form, we define where the user needs to be redirected based on a response from the Open Fisk API. So I took you through before the benefit me example. This is a screenshot of those forms. So as you can see, um, you have a pretty standard looking Drupal web form, or web form uh, and it includes a conditional logic such as the one I showed you with the dependent children. Here are some results and screen pages. Um, so the way this is done is actually using blocks. So basically you have a block for each, or sorry, two blocks for each payment an eligible block, 
and are not eligible block for each payment. And then those blocks are either hidden or shown depending on what comes back from open fisco. So in the case I showed you earlier, we had the eligible for um, job seeker and eligible for um, accommodation supplement, those blocks showed, and then you had the not eligible for the other two blocks showed on the results page. Now obviously we also need to set up the web form handler. So as you can see in this screenshot, we've got a web form handler called Open Fisca Journey Handler that's been added. And we also need to set up the Open Fisca um, API endpoint and the keys in the return value as well. So this is in the third party settings area. Part of this is also the web form field mapping to the Open Fisca field. So you can see you have each of the field, the web form areas, and we link that to a Fisca variable. These are some of the examples. So you can see quite a lot of Open Fisca variables. So this is pulling this information directly from the endpoint that's been put in, in the form of the URL, the API URL. Uh, and then we also have each of the different um, supplements as well, you can see here. In terms of the branching logic, you've got two different examples there. One's quite simple, telling you that um, though you have COVID vaccination eligibility is false, then you redirect them to the page called you are not eligible for a vaccine. Or value of COVID vaccination eligibility is true and it redirects to about your COVID vaccination history. So that's a simple version. On the right, we've got a more complex one, which looks at um, whether they're up to date and it redirects them to different results pages depending on the true false variables that are returned from OpenFisco. Now, the other thing that we can use, um, that we can do using Drupal is that we're able to make the results pages quite contextual. So, for example, we can expose um, responses coming from OpenFisca as tokens. Um, so this one on the right, uh, you can probably see that there's highlighted, yellow highlight. This is content that's actually all information values that have been pulled from OpenFisca. So in this um, case, it's saying that the recommended number of COVID vaccinations for your age and personal situation is four. So it looks at what the person's put in in terms of their age, um, whether they had got any um, illnesses um, that might make them more susceptible and therefore eligible to get an extra vaccination. Um, and then how many they've already had. So it's saying, okay, in your situation, you should have four. Please look in for your third dose, so you've only had two. Um, it's also got a little note there about if you've had COVID in the past three months. And it also includes a recommended vaccine. So depending on, the, in Australia, I know that it was probably very different here, but in Australia, the vaccine that was recommended depended on your age. Um, and so in this case, based on the person's age, then Pfizer was the recommended vaccine. So it's bringing in that open FISC information as tokens. Okay, so what's next in the rules is code space. There are many, many ways you could use rules as code. I've just got 12 ways on screen to sort of get you started, to get you thinking about what you could do. So things like social welfare benefits and eligibility. Obviously, um, with those, we've given you some examples through benefit me. Simplifying tax calculations, compliance checking, urban planning and developments, there are a lot of options there. Future gazing, obviously policy twins during policy development. So I've talked about creating policy twins of existing legislation, but imagine if you did it while you're developing the policy, you could simulate changes to that policy that hasn't even been released yet, see the impact it's going to have, and then, you know, we talk about agile in, in web development, well then in policy development you could be very agile because you'd be able to change what you're deciding to do based on this um, policy modelling. Obviously, you know, AI for everything, but certainly AI has got, um, or could have a role to play within rules as code, such as getting the eligibility logic from legislation. At the moment, it's a manual process. Um, rules as code can also be used as guardrails for AI. So, you know, instead of just getting the response from AI, you could set up rules as code, and then you could also check the AI response is correct, just to help with that hallucination. Um, obviously, 
at some future point, it would be great to have a fully digital legislation and regulation system for government. For GovCMS, so for the Australian government at the moment, they're currently doing the productionising work. So we've, although there's still sand pits happening, and as I said, that's, that's on a separate instance of hosting they're now um, working, doing the first steps, the first discovery sessions for putting that on into the production, bringing into the whole of government GovCMS platform. And the, the ideal is to have uh, rules of code as a reusable shared utility on GovCMS. Now, if you're interested in Rules of Code, you can join the Rules of Code Guild, which is a community space with resources uh, and membership and also a Slack community. Uh, the resources in particular, if you're wanting to see some more examples, it's got a lot of links in there. People doing presentations probably like this one in there as well, so you can actually find out a bit more about Rules of Code. I think one of the most important things, though, dream big. Um, that starts more, but most of all start. So start having to think about how you or your government clients might be able to use rules as code and uh, maybe do a few proof of concepts. Uh, I am going to do Q&As, but I wanted to first give a shout out um, to, of course, the uh, Drupal GovCon sponsors. Thank you to everybody who is sponsoring this fantastic event. Um, and I'm also going to open the Q&A now and you can also scan the QR code up there um, if you're wanting to look at uh, rules of code in general and proof of concepts. So I'm opening up for questions. Yes? Do you have to maintain the rules in a separate repository compared to Drupal Code? So the question was, do you have to maintain the rules in a separate repository to Drupal Code? Yes, you do. So the rules are in the Open Fisca repository and the Drupal is a separate instance. Any other questions? We have one tech question that I could answer. You've got to do one that, that she has to answer. Come on. <laughs> Actually, a question for them. Anyone here heard of this? This is Lisa. Interesting? Yes. Yeah. Do you feel like you have a better understanding now of what it is? And have you got, is your mind ticking about ideas of what you could do for your own agency or for your government? Or oh, we've got some questions now? No, just a comment. Yeah. I wish our IRS had actually did this instead of having private companies. Because that's where I would only uh, assume that I've seen rules as code really working is in our you know, HR block and templates that size. But I assume they're doing it actually just filling in these little things and then they automatically the database to tell you your, how much you're eligible for your tax break and yes. the IRS would do that so we didn't have to pay the private companies for anything to do with this. So I think it's all awesome. That would be good. Um, sorry, so the comment there was just that um, uh, it would be great if the IRS was doing these sorts of things rather than US citizens having to go into private companies and, and use their sort of versions of rules of code where they're entering in the information um, and getting the result of how much tax they're going to need to pay. Other question, comment? Yeah. I don't have a question. But I am here from the IRS. Oh, <laughs> oops, oops. Um, so in this past tax season, in certain states, um, for the first time, it was a direct file option, and it was actually really successful. And I'm not on that project, but it is going to start opening up to more and more states, and actually all the states. And Companies like TurboTax and the Channel Block are actually really scary. Um, this business is going to take away. So, yeah, we're going to it. It's been in the news a little bit, but it's kind of like a slow burn, something amazing that a government agency is doing for once. Um, I work on the IRS now, but I was a team myself. So, um, on the press side, I've got one of the other team members.
I'll just give a quick summary for the recording. So we um, happen to have an IRS representative here who mentioned that there um, has been some states where they were able to um, self-file. I should also say that the um, Australian Taxation um, Board does do that, so we will have the equivalent to the IRS. Um, so we do have uh, people who self-file. So people, some people still go through their accounts, so you know. They have to be a bit scared, but not too scared, I guess. There was a question at the back. Security concerns. Security concerns for rules as code. So part of um, sorry, the question is: Are there any security concerns for rules as code? Uh, part of the work that's happening with the privacy mission and productionising is to look at security and how that's going to be dealt with. But it is also um, open fiscal's uh, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. It's stateless. I think it's the and there's no database. Um, so that helps to reduce some of the security risks, but there will also be, as part of bringing it onto the GovSemis platform, there's going to be, um, you know, obviously a stream looking at that security. Did you have anything to add to that question? Uh, just that uh, GovSemis, yeah, so GovSemis security is like top concern for them, so I know that um, any kind of concerns, at least using that platform, is going to certainly be addressed, but like what Philip has said, you don't have to worry about it um, so much with the FISCA itself um, because it's all sort of temporary information. You're not actually storing the personally identified, uh, identifiable information. And with the web form, we sometimes turn off, you, you can do it, you can turn off so it doesn't store any of the web form results either. Yes, over here? Yeah, um, one quick thing on the IRS direct file last month ish, performance.gov slash. EMA, they did like a 30 minute talk on direct file, it was really great. Uh, if you're interested, I think that's the world, but performance management agenda. Um, second piece of this, and again, uh, crypto, not a crypto growth thing, but just genuine questions. So, Social Security's going bankrupt for the next like, 10 ish years, and it's kind of a comment that like, Social Security be growing from. Uh, it sounds like calculating benefits. Uh, like it just with the general idea, um, it would be really interesting if basically as rules as code, age, and new selections, and then uh, kind of on that trail. Is there like an auditing or blogging like this output had these inputs and like an audit trail? So hypothetically, benefit or your sure agency and social security got this payment. Here's the logging trail. And then we've got for all the social security, but like seven, eight, eight percent here. That would be just an idea, but it's curious, like blogging, like audit trail something. Um, I'm not sure about that one. I mean, I, I, the, the, I know that when you've got, when you're doing testing, we have debug on, so you can actually see what the person selected and you can see all the calculations. But that's more for a QA process, and you can see it then whether it logs it or not. I think it goes back to the security concerns, right? We don't necessarily want to be capturing that information that people are providing um, and tying it back to an, an actual individual, right? The idea is to try to anonymize this so that you can just provide, you know, these general. You're basically saying, do I qualify? Do I qualify? I'm just going to provide, you know. Anonymize information and be able to get that. It's, it's different than if you were to log into a system, um, you know, like Social Security, right? You log in and you can see, you can check and see what your um, your benefit would be, you know, supposedly unless it goes bigger, uh, you know, in so many years when you retire, at, you know, 62, 65, you know, 70, that sort of thing. So it's it's not quite. Um, it's really meant to you know, that you don't have to log in and that you can get access to a lot of useful information about that. Right, you have the web form of the web 